Yale Podcast Network. The dollar can of tuna or um, the impossibly cheap transport of, you know, container ships moving iPhones and tennis shoes is the result of a lack of government out there. And the lack of government out there often allows for, in not all cases, but allows for those players that are looking to be more competitive, to make more money, to sort of edge out their competitors, um, to cut corners, uh, to use uh, sea slaves, you know, um, trafficked workers who are 13, perhaps, that were brought in illegally to their country, put on the ship, and for whom they have no contract, maybe they're even debt bonded. And maybe when they let those guys off the ship a year later after working, they don't even pay them, you know, and these are not unusual stories. Uh, they're quite common. Welcome to When We Talk About Animals, a Yale University podcast devoted to exploring the questions animals raise about what it means to be human. I'm Viveka Morris. And I'm Lindsay Stern. Over 40% of the Earth's surface is open ocean that is over 200 miles from the nearest shore. These international waters exist outside national jurisdiction and almost entirely free of rule of law. Our guest, investigative journalist Ian Urbina, spent five years reporting about what life is like for the humans who roam these seas and about the astonishing array of extra-legal activity that goes on there. Urbina traveled to every continent and every ocean, often hundreds of miles offshore, to report stories from this vast legal void. These narratives are compiled in his best-selling book, The Outlaw Ocean. In his years of nonstop voyages, Urbina risked his life to bear witness to the inhumanity faced by humans in these waters. He witnessed shackled slaves on fishing boats, joined high-speed chases by vigilante conservationists, rode out violent storms, and observed near mutinies. He lived on a Thai vessel where Cambodian boys worked 20-hour days processing fish on a slippery deck, shadowed a Tanzanian stowaway who was cast overboard and left to die by an angry crew, and met men who had been drugged, kidnapped, and forced to cast nets for catch that would become pet food and livestock feed. These stories and many others together make The Outlaw Ocean a masterpiece of investigative journalism and a riveting portrait of a sprawling and often dystopian world where humans, animals, and the environment are regularly treated with depravity. Few people know much about life on the high seas, and fewer people witness it firsthand. Yet we all depend on the fishing, oil, and shipping industries from which these dark tales of human behavior at sea emerge. Our complicity makes the outlaw ocean all the more important and urgent. Ian Urbina has been an investigative reporter for The New York Times for over two decades and is a contributing writer to The Atlantic. He has won a Pulitzer Prize for Breaking News and a George Polk Award for Foreign Reporting. Several of his stories have been made into major feature films, and one was nominated for an Emmy Award. We're honored to speak with him today. Ian Urbina, welcome to When We Talk About Animals. Thanks for having me. In the introduction to your book, you write that for all the truly astonishing adventures that you report about, the most important thing that you saw from the ships that you visit all around the world and work to capture in your book was how woefully underprotected the workers are on ocean waters and the misery that many of them face there. Can you tell us about the labor conditions people face on fishing boats? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the conditions were striking in a couple of ways. Number one, just the sheer invisibility of this workforce. You know, we're talking about 56 million people um, who work, if you think of it, almost as one global factory offshore. Um, that's a huge factory. And as a workplace, it's also a place that we rarely hear stories from. And um, that was especially striking. Um, I think also um, somewhat a result of the almost literary nature of this space. It's been long romanticized as sort of a, a true escape and a kind of um, a, a realm of adventure and, and macho kind of exploration. And um, that I think uh, has given it a certain amount of um, freedom from prying in critical eyes over the years. Uh, and for those reasons, I think um, there's also, and just the sheer geography of getting out there and trying to do journalism in the space, um, there's very little storytelling. There are all conditions on these boats around the world, especially the long haul fishing boats, more so than the 
merchant marine ones that are carrying shoes or iPhones or oil. Um, the, the conditions are sort of something, I guess you'd say were Dickensian, you know, kind of they feel like they're from a different era um, in, in basic ways. Number one, you know, um, these men and boys, it's largely a masculine world out there, um, are working typically six hours a day, uh, six days a week, uh, 20 hour days, um, and uh, legally so. So, you know, fishing has this exemption uh, where um, those sorts of work hours would be illegal in many industries and are illegal. Um, but in fishing, because of the nature of the work, um, uh, it's not illegal. And um, and then just the raw conditions, the nature, the sort of um, decrepit nature of the of the ships, um, uh, the sort of heavy machinery that's being used. Um, working that many hours makes you more prone to slip and fall injuries or um, sort of getting fingers cut off by huge spinning winches and you know 200 ton uh, nets. Um, the potential to drown, uh, waves coming over the sides, you know, a slippery deck. These are typically very unhygienic places. So, you know, roach and rat infested. Um, and then you have folks that are uh, living in the same conditions and they're there sometimes for 9, 12, 15 months at, on end on a single tour. So for all those reasons, it's um, a pretty brutal place. How did you end up there on the ground? Because you were working on a PhD at U Chicago, right? And then you ended up changing course. Yeah, so I um, uh, shifted uh, too many years ago um, to remember, but um, about 20, 25 years ago from anthropology into journalism and um, have spent my whole career at the Times, the New York Times. Uh, and um, while I was an anthropologist, I took a little stint uh, uh, and worked on a, a vessel, a research vessel uh, in Singapore and um, sort of was running away from my dissertation and and uh, wanting to get away from the academic work I was doing and um, ended up being riveted not just by the space that is the blue on the map, you know, um, the far beyond offshore, but also um, quite especially the people that work out there. And, and that was my first exposure to them. And as such, I sort of always harbored uh, this desire to get back to this bizarre, you know, other world, this sort of diaspora, transient tribe of people that live this life. And um, so for, you know, years, I would um, pitch the idea of, uh, at my editors at the Times, of uh, are doing a series about this space that I thought was riveting and important, you know, to um, our the survival of us landlubbers. Um, and it's expensive and time consuming and dangerous and uh, for many reasons, um, not the kind of project that most editors would approve. And uh, finally, I came to one, Rebecca Corbett, who um, uh, was willing to take a chance on it and uh, um, launched me. And um, again, that was a good 15 years into my uh, time at the time, at my, you know, stint at the Times. Um, but uh, we began reporting it in 2015, and um, uh, I'm actually st in, in the next round of reporting still. You write in the introduction to your book about a suggestion that your editor, Rebecca Corbett, gave you early on, which was to focus on the human stories at sea instead of the fish or the environment, and to let the fish and the environment and these other stories come out through the human stories entails, and it's an extremely powerful linkage then that you draw between the human rights abuses and labor abuses and the environmental crimes occurring at sea. And of course, as the book makes clear, we're all involved in this, be it through the iPhones and the other things you mentioned that arrive to us via shipping or via eating fish. And I'm curious, could you speak to the types of human rights abuses that are occurring at sea that consumers in the United States by purchasing these products are, are helping drive? Yeah, I think um, on the highest altitude level, it's important to think about this space and these issues um, from the perspective of hidden costs. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we have a global and a globalized economy that we all as consumers benefit from in the form of cheap stuff, you know, be it seafood or tennis shoes or whatever. And um, that cheapness um, is a direct result of globalization and specifically in the form of, you know, the ability now to move things around 
both the product and the process around pretty agilely. And um, the high seas in particular and the seas in general are a key uh, part of that um, modern luxury uh, because 90% of the things we consume come by way of ship. And the sort of unfettered nature of the high seas, meaning there aren't checkpoints and key taxes and sort of border guards out there on the on international waters that are stopping cargo ships at, you know, every 20 or 200 miles and saying, you know, you've got to pay this fine and we want to inspect that and check on your people and, and see if what you have on board is what you said is on board. Those sorts of things don't exist, right? So things can move pretty fast um, and you can get a dollar can of tuna on your shelf, you know, only, you know, 10 days after, eight days after it was pulled out of the water from some uh, place on the other side of the planet. Um, so I think that in general is how we all benefit um, from the globalized economy. And the, the, the place where hidden costs come in is um, that the dollar can of tuna or um, the impossibly cheap transport of you know container ships moving iPhones and tennis shoes is the result of a lack of government out there. And the lack of government out there often allows for, in not all cases, but allows for those players that are looking to be more competitive, to make more money, to sort of edge out their competitors, um, to cut corners, uh, to use uh, sea slaves, you know, um, trafficked workers who are 13, perhaps, that were brought in illegally to their country, put on the ship, and for whom they have no contract, maybe they're even debt bonded, and maybe when they let those guys off the ship a year later after working, they don't even pay them, you know, and these are not unusual stories, uh, they're quite common. Uh, or, you know, uh, beating, rapes, disappearances on ships, not unusual uh, occurrences, and allowed to occur often with impunity, um, uh, often motivated by cost-saving you know, measures by captains who are looking to send a message to the crew that the next guy that speaks up and pushes back and says he doesn't want to work or uh, whatever um, uh, will suffer a consequence that looks like this. Um, and, and these are all sort of, um, yeah, they're motivated by kind of depravity and evil, but they're also motivated by um, a desire to make things run efficiently and um, inexpensively. And uh, that sort of on a meta level, I think, is how we all benefit from um, these sorts of crimes. In the book, you introduce us to a man named Long Lang, um, who was one of these workers who had come up in one of your long form pieces that ran in the Times. Can you tell us about him, how you came to meet him and that interview you describe in the book? Yeah, so Lang Long um, uh, is a Cambodian m young man who kind of is a, a quintessential uh, archetypal story. Uh, he's from a small village in Cambodia, you know, sort of desperately poor, barely literate, um, and sort of eager to figure a way out of his situation. Uh, he meets uh, what in the region might be called a labor broker, but um, you or I might call a human trafficker or labor trafficker. Uh, at a religious festival one weekend, uh, that labor broker, trafficker um, says, hey, you know, you want to get a decent paying job in Thailand, um, uh, you know, in, in the construction industry, uh, I can make it happen. Lang Long doesn't have any money to pay for transport illegally into the country for fake papers, um, but he's eager for the life-changing opportunity on offer here, ostensibly on offer. Uh, he takes the guy up. He ends up in the back of a truck. He slips across the border, long, you know, journey into um, mainland Thailand. He, along the way, begins realizing, um, again, realize Lang Long is Cambodian. He doesn't speak Thai. Um, and he's realizing along the way that he's actually not destined for a decent paying construction job, but he's actually destined for um, the docks uh, and uh, uh, a fishing vessel. And they're picking up more and more guys along the way, boys included, um, you know, to the maybe two dozen. Um, and when they get to the dock, they get marched onto the ship. And um, the trafficker has, you know, says, look, it costs me whatever the figure is, 200 bucks US to transport these folks in. The captain says, look, I'll pay you for these guys. Um, the captain pays the trafficker and that debt now, you know, the trafficker goes his way, it goes his own way and the, and the, the, the men and boys uh, are marched up onto the ship and each of them now has a debt 
on their head um, and uh, own, that debt is owned by the captain and essentially this is debt bondage and and they say look you know the captain says you'll be working for me until that debt's cleared um, and off they go uh, and you know that's what happened to Lang Long. Lang Long attempted to escape uh, um, you know a couple months into the uh, into his journey he jumped overboard when there was another supply ship nearby tried to swim to it was caught brought back and from then forward uh, Lang Long was shackled by the neck when he wasn't working and um, only by you know luck of a, another supply ship who had a uh, you know ethical Cambodian on board who noticed that there was a guy shackled by the neck and that um, that worker reported back on shore and began working with uh, an NGO to buy Lang Long's freedom. I met Lang Long through that NGO um, a couple of weeks after he got back to shore and told his story. You describe evocatively in the book what it's like to be sitting down with someone who's gone through something like what he went through. Could you take us to that room and your strategy there? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, as a journalist, you're kind of an exploiter, right? You know, I'm, I'm attempting to extract information out of people um, and, uh, you know, have to do so with a certain amount of cunning um, uh, when dealing with ship captains who... Um, uh, might not want to um, tell their story. Um, I have to sort of convey to them that there's reason that they should talk to me. And when dealing with victims of abuse and violence, uh, there's uh, equally something exploitative in what I'm doing. You know, I'm trying to get him to tell me his stories, often at a very vulnerable moment uh, for him emotionally and psychologically. Uh, so, um, that kind of ethical quandary uh, sits in your head if you're at all aware <laughs> of yourself. Um, uh, you really, if you believe in your mission as a journalist, um, uh, the view is that, well, if I can get his story, um, I can actually perhaps help change his life and the lives of so many others that he represents. But I also don't want to get it at the expense of causing him uh, more, you know, psychic damage. So, um, so I'm walking that fine line, uh, and again, all through a translator because I don't speak uh, Khmer. Um, uh, so, um, so in this case, uh, just tactics I've picked up along the way. Originally as an anthropologist, and then as a journalist, just um, the importance of being really transparent with whether it's Lang Long or a ship captain, and laying out. Um, uh, proof that I've done my homework and I, I have um, uh, tried to get a sense of what their perspective might be, what their lived experience has perhaps been, um, and a sort of fluency in their world. I think that goes a long way. Um, a comfort level to some degree with silence and even a, um, a use of silence in a, in a certain way. In other words, um, allowing long pauses to sit heavily on the interviewee and um, not um, removing that discomfort because sometimes it's exactly what's needed to get them to to talk. Um, and so in Lang Long's case, I, I tried to just um, take the interaction super slow and, and um, also talk to my translator and my photographer and said, I'm going to sit there in the beginning of this interview and, and, and let um, and not say anything for a long while and let him sit there and um, a prepare his own thoughts and and sort of get relaxed and b um, let him become a little bit anxious about wanting to hurry up and get down to it um, and uh, and then just I, I don't know I mean I think just trying to start um, in any of these interviews with um, questions that don't feel super aggressive and instead um, allow him to warm up by talking about things that are easy to talk about. Um, a lot of these things are pretty commonsensical, but um, but when you're in the rush of this kind of reporting and you've been on the road for weeks and weeks and weeks and talking with lots of people and you're sleep deprived and wanting to hurry up and get down to it, um, you can forget how important it is to slow down and, and, um, and uh, try to really uh, check in to where that person's head is. Well, you write in the book about how important it was to you, first of all, to report firsthand from the sea, not just to report stories secondhand from the shore, but to be on the boats, seeing it for yourself and experiencing it for yourself, too. And you tell some harrowing tales from 
um, you know, near slips on on these decks to observing um, mutinies in some cases to waking up with rats running all over you and eating the various sort of sea slug soup or whatever is available for food on these on these ships. And I'm wondering, as you were on these journeys and out so far offshore, what sort of impact did that have on you, uh, both physically and, and mentally? I mean, maybe it's better to ask my wife and my <laughs> 16-year-old son um, for an honest answer of that. Um, uh, I mean, I think um, uh, the easier question to answer is the physical. And I do think that uh, physically you have to keep track of yourself, um, uh, both from the perspective of um, getting so worn down that you get mono, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, and you're abroad and you're in, you're right on the cusp of something quite incredible. And then you're taken out of the game because you've pushed too hard, too many days in a row. Um, and then what's it worth, uh, to smaller things. Like if you're going to be on a ship that's extremely unhygienic, um, and you're going to be there for a couple of weeks, um, you know, I got to cut out my habit of biting my fingernails. I got to, stop using contact lenses. Um, I need to make sure I manage any small cuts because all these things can lead to infection. And um, if you're out there, I mean, I had a really robust, you know, first aid kit, but um, even still you, you get a mild infection. It's really going to be a problem when you're, you're so thoroughly dirty you know you can never really get clean uh just because if you're bathing at all you're bathing with a bucket of cold water on the deck in front of a bunch of guys as they're working and so you're not doing good scrubbing of yourself um and uh so you know sort of just management of the machine that is your own body and of your your crew you know you're the Fabio, my Brazilian photographer and my translator and you know like um uh you know sort of just keeping track of how everyone's doing and then being careful on dietary issues too you know i bring little stashes of stuff to sort of maintain my you know my hunger pangs and while eating is one of the best ways to bond with people and um, you don't want to miss meals if you're really trying to establish rapport um, you get kind of good at fake eating, you know, um, where you're not actually taking in that much of that food that you're not sure is actually going to um, go down okay for you. Um, uh, so all these little things are um, helpful. Psychologically, uh, you know, there's a lot of misery in, in what you're seeing. There's a lot of beauty and hope and marvel and super inspirational stuff, heroes along the way that really keep you buoyed. But there's also a lot of you know, um, dark stuff that can wear on you. And I think um, uh, it's um, it, it proved important in, for me, at least personally, to um, keep track of that uh, weight uh, as it accumulates over time. And, and um, you know, whenever you get back to shore, if you're in Kuala Lumpur or Borneo or Singapore or wherever we were at that moment, um, think about whether it's time to, pull out for a month and go back to the U.S. or, you know, um, try another round of going offshore. And these ships that you were living on are not really ships in the traditional sense of the term, in the, you, in the sense that you describe them in the book as floating factories, in effect, floating slaughterhouses that had been transformed by industrialization from um, fishing as kind of an act of hunting, basically, to agriculture at sea. So what was it actually, what does this ship look like and what is a typical day as a, as a worker hauling up these exotic creatures? So, yeah, so if you think of the maritime space um, just broadly, you've got a lot of merchant marines, so these are cargo and they carry wheat and oil and containers with products, right? And that's a whole realm unto itself and not the main focus of my reporting. And then the fishing realm, you've got the folks who go out for a day, two days, three days. Those are smaller ships. They're often artisanal. They're usually locally manned. Um, they can be pretty rough uh, too, pretty brutal, but um, we weren't on those as much. Then you got the long haul ships that are often in, um, industrial and, and some of them um, just capture and store and others actually capture, store and process. The ones that capture, store and process have like a factory a couple decks down 
Um, and it's, uh, you know, a Willy Wonka scene, right? It's got like your conveyor belts and, you know, a, a hustle and bustle of, you know, 20, 30 guys that are moving the fish from these um, sort of open air tanks that they get pulled into um, down the production line where they get sliced and diced and then boxed and, and sort of ultimately into these gigantic freezers. Um, and those are sort of bigger industrial um, vessels. The ones that are uh, the roughest, the ones that are most prone to sea slavery, the ones that are the hygienic conditions that you and I talked about before are kind of one step down from the industrial ones uh, because the industrial ones take a lot of capital um, to have that kind of machinery and men. And so they're pretty rough too, but um, they're not as bad as the ones that are just capturing and storing. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, to, to your other point, kind of the arc of history and sort of the role of technology in both um, improving our ability to police these waters, but also to some greater degree, improving the ability of the fishing industry to take from these waters um, has made this, you know, the technology that allows the sea to now be kind of less art than science, you know, the fishing processes, you look on your monitor and you can kind of see where everything is. It's like a glass tabletop and you see where the big schools are, you see your depth, you see where the, the fish are heading. You have, you know, algorithms that tell you when they're going to arrive and likely what place you see where the other ships are, you know, these sorts of ships um, with massive mechanized um, nets uh, that can, once they get to their location, scoop them up with real efficiency they're kind of um, stunning in their efficiency and uh, to some degree, the biggest explanation as to why the oceans are running out of fish. Um, the ones with the severe human rights abuses tend to be le you know, less mechanized um, and uh, they're using, so a Thai persigner, for example, you know, in the South China Sea might have five Thai officers and, and maybe 40 trafficked Burmese or Cambodian or Laotian crew, and um, uh, the, there'll be very, there'll be there will not be a factory on board. There'll be cold storage. Sometimes it's ice based, not even a freezer. And um, those forty Cambodian crew will be getting in the water, literally, and um, manually in the middle of the night with huge waves, manually moving the nets around into a big circle, you know, to get around the school that they have with some machines eyeballed and found, but some just sort of art of knowing where to go and how to look. So it's it's kind of like a, a really complicated place where you've got high-end industrialized modern stuff happening and really low-end, low-wage, brutal kind of um, yesteryear type uh, non-mechanized stuff happening too. How common is illegal fishing in these contexts versus legal fishing? It's hard to say, right? So any dark economy is always tough to quantify. The numbers you see thrown around, you know, by legit research estimates, one in five fish globally is, uh, so 20% um, is uh, illegally caught. I was surprised to learn in the book that the name Chilean sea bass was a marketing term invented by someone to describe toothfish, these long fish with bulging eyes. In full disclosure, there's an amazing book called Hooked by a Wall Street Journal um, reporter from you know a decade ago that really sort of explains um, that just uh, riveting story of how this LA fish, fishmonger, um, you know, had the uh, realization of number one, this fish tastes pretty good. Number two, it's really ugly and it's got a terrible name. Um, uh, you know, kind of. And if we could just convert that number two, we might be able to sell a lot of um, a lot based on number one. And so um, he did just that. He stopped calling it um, toothfish and um, started calling it uh, Chilean sea bass, and off off it went. You know, and became this sort of market. Um, phenomena that uh, now you can find at most hotels on the menu. And, you know, I, I wanted to, I was actually in, um, on a Chilean, on a Chilean toothfish vessel uh, with Fabio, you know, nine months ago for a long run down into Antarctic waters to sort of look at what those vessels look like um, and um, to live with those guys. And this was like a textbook industrial vessel. It had a huge factory and, um, all Indonesian workforce and, you know, it was pretty um, above 
board and, and how it handled its workers and pay and all that stuff. I wanted to see up close what these fish look like. And they're massive, first of all. They're like, you know, if you stood one up, it, it would be 6'2", six, 6'3", six, you know, and pretty muscular. Uh, and um, they're super ugly. They look like something, you know, from a sci-fi movie. They're bulging and huge teeth and that's their name. And they swim near the bottom of the ocean. Um, and when the, it's just not to get too gross here, but when you pull them up, it, their eyes pop out because of the change in pr pressure and their eyes are like uh, pool cues, you know, they're big. And so they come up over the side of the boat and an ugly fish has gotten even uglier because now their bulging eyes are out of their sockets and they're sometimes still alive and they're really, really powerful. And so it's just this kind of brutal, um, process um, that you see here. And I was looking into a weird side story I mentioned briefly in the book, but the, the fact that whales have gotten really smart and now they know how to target and follow these uh, toothfish vessels and they, they are doing so in large kind of gang-like packs, sometimes for hundreds of miles, and they just wait for the toothfish vessels to pull up, to begin pulling in the you know 20 mile line full of toothfish and the whales attack the line and strip them clean and so it's triggered this kind of war between the toothfish fishermen and and the sperm and and um, orca whales that you know we at one point had 25 just surrounding us um, going after the line and stripping it utterly clean i kept hearing this story from fishermen about just lips just lips they just kept saying like it's all it's all lips and i just couldn't figure out what they were talking about and it turns out that the whales literally eat the entire body but the lips which is the only thing that's hooked on the line and so what comes over the side of the the toothfish vessel is just a long line with hundreds and hundreds of gigantic you know um soccer ball circumference lips um and this is ruinous for the fishermen. You know, it's like five hundred thousand, hundred thousand dollars worth of fish, fish that just disappeared into the stomachs of twelve, twenty orcas that are all around them. So they hate them. But um, and for years, scientists, uh, excuse me, fishermen were you know trying everything they could: shotguns, poison, you know, dynamite, you know, anything to get the whales off their tail. But the whales are you know tough to battle. They're under the water and. So, you know, nothing has worked. And so now we wanted to see what desperate means these guys would go to. They weren't going to do any of the legal, illegal stuff when we were on board, but we just wanted to see if this gizmo they'd invented works. It's kind of a skirt-like neck that protects the fish as it comes up. It doesn't work at all. And uh, whether the other tactic they use, which is trying to outrun them, would work. It doesn't work at all. And so um, what they do is they spend double, triple the amount of time at sea and just sort of roam around and try to shake loose the whales. And when they do, they drop a line really quick, hope it fills up really quick, try to pull it in really quick, and then that's their catch. But for every one time they succeed at that game, they fail two, three times. And so it's just, you know, this fascinating other variable that explains why toothfish population is disappearing so fast. You describe also in that chapter... Um being out on deck, I think, one night and noticing that the whales in the water were sleeping. <laughs> what was, what is, what are they like when they sleep? So this was when, before we launched on the trip, we went to this whale sanctuary, which is this tiny island um, in very south of Patagonia, uh, in Chile, and it's called Carlos the um, Third, uh, And it's got two whale scientists who live there and that's it and um we were killing time before our toothfish vessel would leave and so fabio and i went down to the island to check it out and spend some time there and um it's just this quaint weird place right this tiny island at the bottom of the earth um uh and it is a whale sanctuary and a sort of research depot because um there's a cliff that overlooks this um what you call it, sort of a, a bay type area. And the whales love to come in there. So there's a huge population of whales that sort of tuck in there to hang out and not get run over by ships and whatever. And so um, uh, at night, these whales will sleep and they sort of float to the surface as they're asleep and exhale. And then they sort of sink below the surface for another 20, 30 minutes. I don't know my whale science enough to explain exactly what's happening there or how they do it. But, you know, so, you know, you, 
you're in a place where the sky is really bright with stars and the moon and there are not many city lights sort of around and and um so you can really see oddly uh well out onto the water and there are these kind of mammoth beasts that are quietly um sinking and falling you know um maybe a dozen visible at a time uh spread across this whole bay and they look kind of like submarines you know just and you can hear them they're blowing if that's the technical term they're exhaling is really loud uh and um so it's just this magical bizarre uh place and activity uh especially and 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 i was there partially to see you know to talk to the tooth toothfish vessel guys whose livelihoods are being decimated by these submarine like creatures um they're the whales are cunning and evil and you know kind of the, they have a whole view of how you know the environmentalists have it wrong and the whales are super smart and they're proliferating and they're really conniving and we despise them you know like um uh to to talk to the whale scientist guy on this island you know these are these magical otherworldly creatures that are completely innocent and rapidly disappearing and you know um who would ever want to hurt such things and and i see both perspectives right when you're on the ship and you're seeing these guys who are doing a, a nine-month tour and they're getting their wallets robbed um you can feel their frustration and when you're on the island looking at these beautiful bees uh um, sleeping you can see their beauty as you write in the book there are very few government vessels out in these waters and sometimes none working to protect animals but you profile and you embed yourself with one organization called sea shepherd which has taken it upon itself to police some of these some of these areas can you explain what sea shepherd does and what your experience was like with that group Yes, yeah, so Sea Shepherds is really interesting and, and very successful conservation, ocean conservation group. Um, it, to some degree, is a off-cropping, at least at its outset, from Greenpeace and was started by Paul Watts and some others um, uh, as uh, what was meant to be a more direct action, more aggressive ocean conservation group. Um, and, you know, pretty well known now because they have a huge fleet of ships and lots of TV shows about them and, and are sort of very daring um some critics would say um, over the top, um, aggressive, but um, really sort of willing to go to um, greater lengths to try to block things that they feel are wrong. And one of the um, types of campaigns they're most uh, um, known for, um, well documented in the show Whale Wars on Discovery Channel, is um, their fight, Sea Shepherd's fight um, against a Japanese whaling uh, fleet that um, is one, if not the only, um, nations that's still doing whaling on the high seas. Um, and, uh, you know, Sea Shepherd's been out there and rammed their ships and blocked them and done all sorts of aggressive stuff. Um, I was interested in Sea Shepherd because they were engaged in this new type of campaign where they were really trying to embarrass the world community and show the sort of, um, inanity of, of international law when it's not enforced and the frustration that, you know, for a long, for a long while there's been, you know, what's called the Interpol Purple List, which is um, essentially a list of really bad actor ships that should be arrested on site. And, um, and yet these ships operate with impunity and sort of offload and onload and, you know, go around the world and, and do business as they please, even though they're systematically breaking laws and earn themselves a position on that list. And um, Sea Shepherd said, you know, laws are only as good as their enforcement. No one's out here enforcing those laws. And these are clearly well-documented bad actors. So we're going to find them and we're going to not ram them, but we're going to draw a lot of attention to them and um, embarrass governments for not acting and embarrass the ship owners of those ships um, by putting them on the world stage. And so they went after one ship in particular called the Thunder, which was the top of that list. 67 million dollars worth of illegal fishing in antarctic waters um and they found these guys nets in the water the thunder uh, crew and ship uh, in antarctica and and sea shepherd um began this epic kind of uh chase that lasted 110 days and 10 tens of thousands of miles from antarctica all the way up north to the coast of uh, uh south tome and principe an island off of uh, african continent um, and just the, the story of that chase, what the Sea Shepherd ships had to go through to keep up with these guys and just this, uh, you know, uh, was really riveting. And um, I was lucky enough to 
um, uh, get on board for, for part of that chase so I could tell that story. Sea Shepherd is focused primarily on the environmental costs of illegal fishing. And you recently wrote a piece based on this reporting for Yale E360, the magazine, about the linkage and the importance of recognizing the linkage between environmental crimes and human crimes on the ocean. Do you see groups like Sea Shepherd or other environmental groups starting to focus more on the human costs that are interrelated to the environmental costs um, and, and vice versa with, with human, right, human rights groups? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, to, I think Sea Shepherd is uh, starting to pay a little bit more attention to these sorts of issues. I mean, every organization has to be careful about mission creep, and I'm respectful of that. At the same time, I think it's really perilous to um, silo uh, the concerns here, sort of the above the water versus below the water concerns, because um, you might, uh, you know, end up having to reinvent the wheel after you say, oh, we've solved the problem of illegal fishing, and this company is doing a good job. Oh, wait, here comes an article that says they're using 13-year-olds, you know, um, and killing some of them in the process, uh, and then you look like a fool. So I think um, just from an institutional point of view, it makes sense to really be thinking holistically about these crimes and how they feed off each other. I do think um, Greenpeace and um, Environmental Justice Foundation, um, uh, EJF, they're often called, um, do have for a while been doing a lot of uh, pretty impressive work investigating the intersection between human rights and labor crimes at sea and uh, illegal fishing. And um, so I think they're further along in that process of really trying to talk about sea slavery um, as it interplays with illegal fishing. Um, so I think that's good. Um, and uh, uh, I do think that it's a legitimate, you know, you talk with Interpol and you talk with um, folks who are in law enforcement in the space and, and you know, the, the, the overlap of types of criminality, you know, money laundering and drug running and, you know, kind of human slavery and um, debt bondage um, and illegal fishing um, is pretty well documented. So um, these ships are often engaged in all these kinds of crimes. Uh, so from a practical standpoint, it makes sense to, to, um, to focus on them. And then there are organizations like, you know, newfangled organizations that are using technology to try to get more eyes on the sea for the sake of benefiting or um, uh, confronting both of these problems. So, you know, uh, Global Fishing Watch is, is uh, one great example of an organization that's kind of pushing for um, using satellites to uh, really track where ships are going and what they're doing for the sake of both better journalism on sea slavery and um, law enforcement on sea slavery concerns, as well as um, efforts by you know countries to just protect their waters um, uh, of, from illegal fishing. You write in the book at one point that the sea, this vast expanse, is not just ungoverned currently, but in some ways ungovernable. And I'm wondering if you could explain uh, what you meant by that. And then within that, what interventions, national or otherwise, at the consumer level as well, do you think would be most effective at driving change, both for the environment and for the humans who are suffering on the ocean? So on the, se the second question, I'm always a little reluctant of going too far down the path of sort of suggesting concrete fixes because it feels a little bit out of where the, the zone of where journalists should be and advocates are, you know. Um, and so in the book, I tried to sort of sidestep that, um, like, what do we do, you know, uh, type question by offering an appendix that said, well, first, don't get overwhelmed by the outlaw ocean as a notion. You know, it is um, a sprawling, it's kind of like a book about injustice. You don't ask, how do I solve injustice? You know, mm -hmm. that's a, that, first, don't ask that question. <laughs> Second, <laughs> ch choose which injustice you want to do domestic violence or homophobia mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever, you know, um, choose your specific version of injustice and then that speaks to you and then hone in on that. And likewise, you know, don't try to solve the outlaw ocean. Mm -hmm. Try to pick, are you concerned about murder of stowaways? Are you concerned about illegal dumping of oil at sea? Are you concerned about arms trafficking at sea or murder with impunity? Are you concerned about, you know, ocean plastic or shark finning? You know, there's all sorts of different stuff in there. Um, and you kind of have to come down to the right altitude to have any chance of, of avoiding demoralization. Um, so that's the first thing. And then the appendix is somewhat anemic, but, you know, an effort on my part to say, okay, 
based on that altitude of analysis, here are organizations that are doing really, in my view, good work in each of those topic areas. Um, this is not a long-winded plug for people to go out and buy the book, um, but it is kind of all in there in the appendix, the best I could muster on how people can engage. I do think, um, I would say, uh, you know, this is not a problem that, in my view, will be solved um, primarily um, or exclusively by governments. It's probably going to have to um, have a huge market kind of corporate side um, role because I think companies, so, you know, Walmart, right, tomorrow decides that, look, we don't want to be sullied by this whole thing that that guy at the Times and the, 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 the team at AP and Guardian and other places um, have talked about this whole issue of sea slavery. We don't want to sell tuna and, and shrimp and whatever else that has that hint on it. So we are going to require these new um, things in our supply chain for you um, said fish, fishing companies to be able to sell to us so that we can sell to our huge mass of consumers. You have to comply with these things. Now that circumvents governments. That's not legislated. That's just a company that's saying from now on, we're going to try to take the high road and we're only going to sell stuff that fits these parameters. And that's going to mean that dollar can of tuna goes up to dollar 40 or something. And that's not great. It makes some people unhappy, but that's the, pr and I'm making up these numbers, but that's the, the cost of having um, a improved supply chain. And I think corporate players, not to beat up on Walmart, but big corporate players really have not done enough of that. And that's why I think, to bring it back to journalism, that's why I think like a continued um, spotlight on this stuff is so essential because that applies pressure to the big players to clean up their act and exert some ethics in the marketplace. Um, so I think that's probably going to have to happen and that will come from journalists and from folks like you doing stories like this that sort of inform consumers that there's a problem out there and then those consumers start writing letters to their lawmaker or start asking at the grocery store or start looking online for what companies actually already are doing this and that's how change happens in my view. So the lawlessness of the sea and the difficulty of enforcing um, boundaries there has also enabled doctors to help women who need abortions and aren't able to have them in their home countries to international waters. And you describe one such story in the chapter on Adelaide's voyage and Rebecca Gompertz, the Dutch doctor who founded Women on Waves. Can you just describe that to us? What's that project and what was it like to be on board the Adelaide? Yeah, so Rebecca Gompertz, as you mentioned, is a, a former Greenpeace doctor who saw a lot of things that bothered her, um, uh, especially with the young women who were in dire need um, in various places um, for um, abortions. And um, she created uh, her organization called Women on Waves, um, which essentially uh, takes a ship. Uh, these days, it's a yacht, um, but in the past, it's been a bigger ship um, to countries, to the coast of countries that um, uh, where, where abortion is illegal and, and often even more so, it's, it's da downright dangerous um, for uh, the women attempting to get a black market abortion, um, uh, both the procedure itself and, and also the backlash they can face in society. And Rebecca will bring her team and the ship to these countries. Um, we'll plug into sort of an underground railroad of um, healthcare providers who are doing this sort of um, quiet work on behalf of young women and girls um, or older women. Um, and um, we'll uh, line up a, a number of clients of young women who will, who are seeking uh, not a surgical abortion, but a medical abortion. So are you 40, 46 pills, you know, uh, that stimulate a, um, uh, a miscarriage and um, they'll pick up you know, again, under um, the cover of secrecy, they'll pick up these young women, take them out to international waters. You know, the, the legal situation is that um, when you're on a ship and you're in national waters, you're, you're required to comply uh, with the, the laws of that land. The minute you get beyond the 200 mile mark, you're fully in international waters. And the laws that apply on your vessel are the laws um, of the flag you fly. So if you're flying a Liberian flag or a you know Moldovian flag or a um, or an Austrian flag, um, then those are the laws that apply on your vessel. And in Rebecca's case, um, uh, 
uh, uh, she flies an Austrian flag where abortion is illegal and is legal, excuse me. And um, so once she gets out past that 200 mile mark, she can legally uh, administer these pills and do all the other things that she needs to do to um, provide this service safely to her clients. She does so, and then she quietly brings them back to shore and they um, return to their lives. And usually after doing a couple of these missions in a country, then Rebecca will, will switch gears, kind of come on radar, alert the press, hold a press conference. And that's sort of a second different stage of what she's doing, which is essentially rabble rousing and raising a debate around these issues in her in that country. And that often gets her kicked out, you know, and, and of the country um, pretty quickly. So um, I had wanted to profile her for a while. Um, I thought she was sort of a textbook um, example of um, the extra legal nature of the high seas you know it's not all bad behavior out there it's a lot of things that are outside the reach of law um, uh, and uh, it took a little bit of convincing uh, typically there aren't males on these ships um, but rebecca was kind enough to um, uh, allow me and fabio to um, come down and uh, embed on on one of her missions in mexico and uh, sort of tell the story how did seeing this place without civilization as we think of it today change how you think about human nature? I was always a dark dude, you know, like <laughs> I had a pretty low um, uh, outlook on, on fundamental human nature and sort of have always been of the view that um, we as a species, men and women, kind of us humans need some system on us to uh, keep us in check. And I think most people are good. I've always thought that, but um, there are some, you know, dark uh, forces out there, some of them in us as people and some of us external to us, like globalized capital, you know, um, and those things together um, can make people do things that are deeply inhumane and, and pretty dark. Um, and uh, I think this world, um, you know, again, there are lots of heroes out there who are uh, putting their lives on the line and, and operating clearly outside the reach of the law, sometimes breaking the law um, decidedly uh, to do things that are really inspiring and humane uh, for creatures or people. Um, uh, there are also a lot of people out there who are doing um, a lot of the same sort of stuff that um, are doing it largely just to sort of um, make money and, and um, exert their own agency and um, get the job done that they need to get done. And um, so all that meant I kind of thought, wow, this is, um, it's kind of a Lord of the Flies experiment where I got to see uh, a space that um, uh, could allow for um, uh, darker uh, forces to go unchecked. To close, we like to ask each guest that we interview to recommend several books or films or other works that have had a significant influence on how they approach their work. You write in the book that you had a good amount of time when you were traveling and, and sometimes on the ships to read. And I'm wondering, would you please share several recommendations? Oh, wow. You kind of jumped me with this one. Now I'm going to look very unliterary. Um, oh, you're uh, very literary. No. Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean... Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I I think that um, well, in the realm of of ocean interest, and specifically on the topics of the kinds of abuses that exist out there, um, you know, it was a, a really amazing journalist out of New Zealand named Michael Field, and he produced a great book called The Catch, which I leaned on heavily, which was all about the Ouyang fleet, and he's just a great writer and a great reporter and. Um, I do think hooked, you know, if you're interested in that crazy story about how marketing, you know, can change something that's ugly and turn it into something that's super popular um, is also a great, I'm blanking on the author, but it's, it's a really good book. Um, I, I passed a lot of my time um, reading, you know, uh, random things that I just thought that inspired me from a writing perspective, The English Patient, Michael Ondaatje, um, big fan of an anthropologist named Clifford Gertz, uh, and um, uh, there's a book by him called Af After the Fact. Um, you know, th this sort of writing helped me try to get my head to an altitude where I could think a little bit more philosophically about the nitty gritty of this world. Um, uh, and those books um, have that grace and that altitude that I needed. Um, so those are just some that come to mind. 
Well, Ian Urbina, thank you so much for joining us, and, and thank you for The Outlaw Ocean, which is truly a must-read and extraordinary contribution to our understanding of this hidden world. Well, thank you. Thank you, too, to Ryan McAvoy, the Yale Broadcast Studio, and Daniel Block for their work on this episode. When We Talk About Animals is supported by the Law, Ethics, and Animals program at Yale Law School and the Yale Human Nature Lab. We would love it if you would subscribe to When We Talk About Animals on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, write us a review, and check out our website, whenwetalkaboutanimals.org, where you can find out more about Ian Urbina and the Outlaw Ocean. Thanks for listening.